uh, thank the Jewish Federation uh, of Broward for hosting this talk and um, and I welcome each of you out there. Uh, I know I can't see you, but I do want to let you know that you guys have a chat box there and that will be one of the ways you'll be able to communicate with me if you have questions and certain times I may ask you some questions. Um, and, and that's how we can communicate. Uh, so again, welcome. Um, and you know, today we're gonna talk about uh, an important topic. We, we have a lot going on and have had quite a bit going on this year in 2020. And we wanted to offer um, a presentation to talk about ways that we can uh, effectively and sensitively interact um, with many individuals in, in our community um, that are significantly struggling at this time, in particular Holocaust survivors, our seniors, uh, and other members, which we'll talk uh, more about here. So um, our objectives today, we're going to take a few minutes and uh, just look at an overview of what's been going on locally and on uh, and nationally and internationally and, and how these events impact our ourselves, our loved ones, and our community. Uh, we want to take a few minutes and talk about psychological, emotional, and biological impacts of stressful events, and then take a closer look at our community, and um, there's some unique characteristics um, for us to take into account as we think about who we will be assisting, who we're working with. Um, I also wanted to incorporate and talk to you about trauma-informed guidelines. Uh, these are, you know, uh, great ways and approaches for thinking about how to interact with people who might be responding in ways because of past trauma or, or current stressors. And lastly, we'll talk about uh, tips for coping, uh, both for yourself and to share with others that you might be working with. So, you know, we're six months into uh, 2020 and quite a bit uh, has been going on already. February 14th marked the second year anniversary of uh, the shooting at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And we have, you know, an entire community in Northern Broward that's still reeling from, these, uh, from, from this event. And it, it continues uh, to impact uh, their, the health and, and mental health of, um, of our MSD, Coral Springs Parkland community. Uh, obviously, one of the main reasons we're having this conversation today is uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and um, how, you know, the virus itself and our response uh, to the virus has impacted just about everybody's lives. <clears throat> so we want to take a look at that. Uh, we also know that, you know, events over the last several weeks has also highlighted, um, you know, a lot of the uh, social inequalities and, and injustice faced by many members of our of our community and um, and how, you know, intergenerational trauma and, and daily trauma within our black community and, and other community members that are dealing with uh, significant op oppression, uh, injustice, uh, racial discrimination and prejudice um, and adding on to during this time of a pandemic. We'd like to talk about that. And then we're in South Florida. So uh, we're, we've just entered hurricane season. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to, to talk a bit about that as well as we have a community here that has been impacted by, um, by significant hurricanes uh, in the past and in our recent past as well. So if, if I could actually see you all, I'd be asking for, for a show of hands, but I, you can type it in this box too, if you feel like interacting today. Um, but how many of you have noticed either within yourselves or your loved ones and others around you, and I'd say over the last two months, increase in irritability, uh, frustration, uh, tolerating things that normally perhaps you were fairly easygoing, but notice maybe you're a little bit snippier or uh, lower mood, um, those types of things. Anybody notice any of that with, amongst yourselves or others? Yeah, so we're we're getting some some hand raises here, and um, you know what? What's yep? We have five of you, six of you. Okay, I get the hands are going up, so this is this is fantastic. And <laughs> so so when it comes to stress, I would say that when we have um, an amb ambiguous situation, we have changes in our lives we're gonna notice uh, our stress levels uh, going up. So I thought we'd, we'd take a few minutes to talk about stress. Now, stress in general gets a bad rap because we usually tend to only talk about it when it becomes overwhelming or when it's creating some challenges. But stress in itself is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, um, stress uh, actually helps us with learning and helps us 
um, become more alert and cautious and avoid harm. As a matter of fact, some of the earlier studies on, on stress, this study by Dodson and Jerkies that occurred back in 1908, we learned that there's actually a re this relationship between anxiety and performance, so our ability to do well on a task. And we actually, what we found is we actually need a certain amount of stress in order to do well. And to put it in context, so if I, let's say I'm teaching one of my classes and um, we're getting ready for midterm exams and one of my students thinks, ah, Dr. Ruiz is easy, this information, the test is not going to be a problem, this is great, and stress level's low, what we will probably see is they're not going to maybe put as much um, effort into studying because they're not going to think that it's um, a, a significant task, for example. So performance is likely going to be lower. On the flip side, if there's too much stress, right, and an individual is so anxious about their performance that they're having a hard time concentrating and focusing and taking information in, they're probably also not going to do well. So what we found is actually a moderate level of anxiety or moderate, moderate level of arousal or stress actually helps us when um, we're trying to take in more information or shift or change behavior. So as we think about why, let's make sense as to why we see stress level come, uh, coming up at this time uh, in an adaptive way uh, with that stress raising, as we were hearing, you know, there's this new virus, we need to, you know, find a way of keeping it from, um, from spreading. As our stress level rises, we pay more attention, we become more alert, we become more cautious, we're looking at, well, what can we do? What can I do to stay safe? Um, and we pay attention, right? So if our stress level was too low, we likely wouldn't be listening to, you know, how to, um, you know, uh, hygiene and, and washing our hands and wearing masks, those types of things. So some level of stress is okay. Uh, having said that, where it becomes a challenge is when we have chronic stress. And uh, those of you that were, you know, raising hands here, um, what's happened is that our stress levels, uh, as we've gotten further through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, has been more chronic. And there's been a variety of other stressors upon stressors for many, uh, which has increased the arousal level. And we haven't had too much time to have that arousal come down or adjust because there's been a lot of changes. So what we see, and we know that prolonged chronic stress has a variety of negative effects on our mental health uh, and our overall physical um, well-being. So we know that there's been an increase in anxiety and fear and worry about the virus. Um, we've noticed individuals who were not necessarily experiencing depression um, or mood challenges becoming um, more depressed or being more irritable. Uh, we're seeing increase in substance use as a way um, to kind of cope with the stress. And, um, and then some individuals will, will also experience, and by the way, kids will show a lot of physical symptoms versus coming and saying, hey, you know, I feel down or I feel scared. Um, they're more likely to present with things like headaches and stomach aches, those types of things, difficulty concentrating. And adults, we, we have these as well. And again, individuals who are struggling with mental health conditions or medical conditions can also see those symptoms uh, worsen or have uh, more challenges in managing them with stress levels uh, being high for, for a significant period of time. Now, there's some specific things about COVID and our COVID pandemic that, um, that has led to this increased anxiety as well. There's some unique things. So first off, we have, we had a virus that literally, what we called it the novel virus. We didn't know much about it initially. Um, uh, when we first heard, we knew this was a virus that was outbreaking in Wuhan, and we weren't sure what it would look like here. We didn't know too much about how to protect ourselves. We weren't too sure um, about treatments. So that in itself, you know, we don't tend to do too well uh, when we're uncertain about things. We tend to do better when we feel we have more control of situations and we're, we have information. So early on, there wasn't a whole lot of information, and we had, uh, and that led into or fed into this um, anxiety and stress. The other thing is that, again, one of the ways to be able to maintain uh, health and, and uh, stop the spread was the idea of social distancing or is the idea of social distancing. And we are social creatures by nature. We do really well when we're around others, we learn from others, we get reinforcement from others, we feel good, people smile around us, we smile and, and, and uh, it's good for us. So here we are in an interesting situation, which, which we're saying in a sense is don't be too close to someone because that could be uh, a challenge to your health. And that 
um, aside from a, a potential increase of isolation for some people, it adds to uh, a level of fear. Um, we have financial stressors and part of that is from unemployment and part is uh, from, from a, a variety of other factors. I would imagine that there's no one in this room that doesn't know at least someone that's been impacted financially um, by this virus. And when we have, um, by the pandemic, you know, when we have situations such as unemployment and, um, and financial stressors, we now also will likely uh, start to run into, and we have run into, increased food insecurity. People don't have access to food. Concerns about housing, the basic needs uh, start to be impacted. Um, the illness, fear of illness and, and death, and what's been particularly uh, unique in, in the way to also manage this, uh, if you have a loved one, uh, that becomes ill, whether with COVID or not, uh, we're understanding that we're not necessarily going to be able to be with our loved ones in the hospital, and that is scary. Finding out a diagnosis of being positive for COVID, knowing it could look in a variety of different ways, increases anxiety. And in terms of losing a loved one, the mourning process has also been impacted as uh, many individuals are not able to, to participate and uh, practice mourning in the way they normally would. Basically, our we've had major changes in our day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Uh, we have some groups that are particularly vulnerable. You know, so the, the topic of, of this presentation is how to work with um, or you know, communicate and interact with individuals that are, that are impacted uh, by COVID. And, and there are some specific groups to really think about here. Uh, so those who've lost income and, and facing financial uh, hardship, um, the impacts are longstanding. So even if an individual, what, they're able to find employment um, at this point in time, many of them have started, have incurred significant debt and are very concerned about their ability to be able to catch up. And some have still not been able to find employment. Uh, those who are experiencing food insecurity. Um, parents who are working from home while also caring for young children due to school closures, um, this is important because these parents are wearing all hats all at the same time, being a parent, being a spouse, um, being a teacher, being a caretaker, being a coworker and an employee. And it's not like they can split up uh, these, uh, these roles are kind of co-occurring and, and the stress level that we're seeing with these parents is, is off the charts. Um, those obviously who are mourning loved ones at this time, uh, those who have been identified as being in the high risk category. So if you fall in the high risk category each time that people talk about the high risk category, which is just about in every news briefing, just about in, uh, in any uh, commercial that's out there, uh, all of uh, the information pamphlets that are there. Uh, so if you fall in that high risk category each time you hear these things, anxiety, uh, level goes up. And while when we start to move further into reopening and others start to uh, kind of go back to, you know, a, a normal or a new normal, these individuals are not necessarily able to take uh, those steps. And that's something for us to continue to think about as, uh, as we move forward. Those who had mental health conditions, um, also more vulnerable. And, and here's another area, those who are living in high conflict homes or abusive homes and home environment, uh, what we're you know, imagining is gonna happen as we open up and, and, and kids are able to go back to schools when we're probably going to see uh, the impact as we have these stressors occurring, financial insecurity, food insecurity, um, the high stress level increases um, irritability uh, and violence. So uh, we do have a subset of individuals quite struggling quite a bit without uh, having access to others where they would normally at, be able to ask for help. Our frontline workers um, and people who are who were already already socially isolated and lived alone um, and those who are experiencing homelessness. So you know, we're talking about our stressors right now, uh, but what I wanted to bring into focus is that really our past experiences influence how we manage things today. So if we've dealt with some challenging situations in the past and we've had some helpful coping mechanisms, those are gonna come into play today. Um, same as if we've had challenging situations in, uh, in the past 
and um, and we have some ongoing challenges or we could be triggered today. All of those things also come into play as to how we're looking um, at our uh, at our current situation or managing stressors. So let's talk about trauma, right? Um, so so trauma is really a psychological response to uh, an event or series of events uh, that were life-threatening or extremely disturbing. Um, and, you know, we have, the reason I'm bringing this up is that we have populations here in Broward County that, um, that have experienced significant trauma. And some of the responses we may see as we're caring for these individuals um, are likely due to those um, uh, being triggered uh, from those past experiences. And I wanted to talk a bit about what happens to our body and our brain when we experience a traumatic event, or let's talk about a fearful event, right? Um, so here's here's our brain, and we have, uh, if you look here on the screen, the little yellow uh, circles, the almond-shaped uh, bulbs, that's the amygdala. And that's, if you think about it, that's our alarm system in the brain. So if you had this lion, not, not a little nice fluffy cub, but this lion, were to walk into our room, right? Um, we would have one. Uh, we would have one of three possible responses. Now, in your chat box, I know some of you are raising hands, but if you're able to type into the chat box any questions, for example, it would be great. But I want to ask you one. So, if this line comes into the room, and I'm saying we're going to reflexively respond in one of three ways, anyone know what those ways are? Yep, fight, flight, or freeze. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sam. So absolutely, and um, so we're either going to punch the lion, take a chair, hit the lion. Uh, if we're if we're close enough, we might run away if we can. And typically, if you can't do either one, the third one will come in. You know, and uh, the scientific term for that is actually called um, tonic immobility. For those of you that you know like to learn something new. Um, so yes, and, and we don't think about this. These are responses that are reflexive, they're automatic. And that's important to know because, so again, this is a fear response to an actual threat. And by the way, anxiety is um, a, uh, a response to an anticipated threat. But let's look at what happens to our body. So that alarm system goes off, right? And, um, and what it does is it activates our sympathetic nervous system and certain things start to happen in our body in order to prepare us for either fight or flight or freeze. Okay, so our heart beats faster where our lungs um, are taking uh, quicker deep breaths, right? And the idea for that is to get oxygenated blood pumping fast through to our muscles, to our extremities to be able to fight, uh, fight or flee. Right, uh, and then our pupils dilate, and that's so that we can kind of pinpoint and focus. We're going to be focused on that line, and um, and we might also start to become hypervigilant. Our hearing, we might be more attuned to what's going around on around us, and listening for those sounds, in order to respond. And then those things within our 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 body, uh, those systems that are not necessarily going to help us with fight or flight. They get shut down or, or slow down. So our bowels, our stomach, we stop digesting food. Now, why this is important is so when we when we're in an immediate threat and this kicks in, right? We need all of this to happen. But an individual that gets stuck in, in a chronic stress response, their sympathetic nervous system is online more so than their parasympathetic nervous system. Or when somebody is triggered and they have a, a flashback, for example, this system turns on. So what we see is individuals under chronic stress uh, and many individuals that have experienced traumatic events and have developed uh, traumatic post-traumatic reactions to those are chronically, their alarm system's a little bit more sensitive and more likely to be uh, triggered by events around them. Uh, so some, there are some elements about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and responses and um, various things on the news, for example, that uh, might actually trigger um, some of these responses in, in some of our, uh, our loved ones or community members. Now, just to give you an idea of what some post-traumatic stress responses are, uh, they fall into four main categories. Uh, so an individual might have intrusive memories or thoughts about the event or what happened. You know, if I were to put this in context, for example, to some of our, uh, our students or staff that worked at Marjorie Stillman Douglas, um, it's not, um, you know, what they may have is 
you know, an image that continues to come up or a particular feeling that they had, that, that fear uh, response, or if there was not, you know, they were nauseated during the event, that, that feeling might come up. And also uh, avoidance is quite common, right? If no one wants to feel bad and if you're thinking about something that's disturbing and you start to feel panicky or you start to feel um, some pretty intense reactions, we're gonna start to avoid people, places and things conversations that might remind us of the event. Um, so that's one of the typical um, sets of, of symptoms that we see. Uh, we see some cognitive and mood changes, uh, our memories impacted, you know, when I, that picture of the brain where we had um, the yellow, the round yellow things, which was the amygdala, the other one was, um, I'll just show you here. Right, so right here we have the hippocampus, and that's involved in memory consolidation. Uh, and that's why um, events that happen when we are in a very highly aroused state get encoded differently. And sometimes, um, you know, they, they come up more in uh, images and visceral uh, responses versus almost a storyline like other memories are. So um, we can have a variety of mood changes and cognition changes. You know, one of the common things you typically see in trauma, especially if it's um, a trauma related to person on person, interpersonal trauma is um, feeling alienated, uh, feelings of shame and also negative beliefs about the world um, and, and other individuals. You know, I'm not safe, the world isn't safe. And probably what might get somebody to come into therapy is that last comment, uh, arousal and reactivity, and also what other people might notice as uh, maybe behavior that's frustrating or, or confusing, uh, irritability or anger outbursts, being self-destructive, um, being very jumpy, uh, exaggerated startle response, uh, which could lead to problems with concentration, sleep, those types of things. All right. Uh, and I already talked a little bit here about what triggers are. Um, and a flashback is, is, is a form of re-experiencing uh, some elements of uh, traumatic events. Okay, I do know some of you guys are raising your hands. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in here and I would be happy to, uh, uh, to answer. Don't see any here. Um, so, as we think, feel free to, to type and I'll, I'll read them as, as we go along here. Um, all right, so there, we do have some specific community members, all right, um, that have experienced significant trauma. And I just wanna bring those up a little bit for us to talk about our Holocaust survivors. And I'll talk a bit about that community here in a second. I've talked about the MSD community, our black community and others who are experiencing oppression and social injustice. We have um, here in South Florida survivors of natural disasters, right? We had Hurricane Andrew, Irma, Dorian, uh, which just occurred. Um, and if we look at other more chronic stressors, if we look at the US Census data for Broward, we have an estimated uh, 12.6% of residents live in poverty, and that comes out to about uh, over 246,000 people that are struggling with finding affordable housing, to have roof over their head, food insecurity, and unemployment. This doesn't even include individuals who have experienced uh, other major traumatic events, uh, such as assaults, physical assaults, sexual assaults, our veterans. Um, so we, um, we have a lot of individuals in our community that have had past stressors that are being impacted by these current ones. Our Holocaust survivors, for those of you that don't know, um, we have a little less than 2,000 Holocaust survivors here in Broward County. Uh, JFS actually serves over 800, 850 uh, Holocaust survivors that are eligible for reparations. And um, with funding through the Claims Conference and support through the Jewish Federation of Broward, we're able to provide Holocaust survivors with access to home health care aids, uh, transportation, um, medications, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, if we think about traumatic events that have happened, uh, that some of our, holo now, many of our Holocaust survivors are, were child survivors of the Holocaust, and um, these are some, just some of the traumatic events they may have experienced. Uh, during the Holocaust period, uh, persecution and denial of rights, brutality and murder by armed guards, um, 
with starvation, witnessing of murders and mass killing and forced labor. And if we look at our MSD community, again, this was a community trauma. Um, we're dealing with a lot of grief and loss. There was 17 fatalities and seven injured. Um, we have an ongoing trial, which uh, I recently actually they just mentioned is, is paused indefinitely due to uh, the pandemic. So there's there's this element of just not having closure, uh, which which is important. And then in terms of oppression and injustice, right? So what's in, what's oppression? Um, it occurs whenever one person exercises authority or power over another in an abusive or cruel way. And there are some, um, quite a bit of research that looks at uh, the impact of racial discrimination on an individual. Uh, we do have, we do see the chronic stress. We see increased health problems. They're much more likely to experience mental health problems such as depression and anxiety. They're much more likely to report a lower quality of life. Um, and then there's the impact of intergenerational trauma uh, due to history. We have slavery, race, and um, chronic history of racism, social injustice. You know, so it isn't a one-time event. What you have is individuals that have been living with a lifetime of fear and anxiety and frustration uh, and anger. Now, I do know some of you had your hands up, and I don't know if it's just that I'm not able to see it on my end if you're putting questions, but please feel free uh, to put questions up here if you want. So uh, there are pos so let's talk about triggers, right? So you know, up here on the screen, I have uh, three images um, that have a similar context, right? We have hands up, and um, and each of and each of these pictures could actually bring up, or pictures of someone with their hands up could uh, could actually trigger different individuals in, in a variety of ways. And this is just an example to say that triggers can be. Uh, are occurring quite quite frequently around us, and we may not be aware of how they're impacting others. You know, watching an image over and over of of, of someone's death, uh, extremely uh, disturbing, but also be extremely triggering to someone else who um, who has experienced a, a loss due to violence um, or has seen uh, violence in the past. Um, you know, and what's the common denominator here with these three? You know, the first one is uh, from the Holocaust. The second is from um, one of the the Black Lives Matters uh, protests, and uh, and the third, this is uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas students um, leaving their classroom with their hands up. And all of these uh, have an element of violence uh, and interpersonal trauma. Okay, so we have we have a question here. Um, okay, or comment. One of the survivors, this is uh, Rabbi uh, Andrusier, one of the survivors we work with said to me that she feels like this is another Holocaust. How would you respond to that? Perfect. And uh, Rabbi, uh, what we'll do in a little bit as I start to shift into ways uh, to respond, uh, it'll be a little bit clear uh, on, on that part. Um, but I love that you brought this up because this is this is a prime example that when we start when we're seeing images on TV, and um, oh hi Leva, <laughs> thank you great I know I can't see you but hello, um, when we see images it could uh, be triggering things right so so if uh, this is a great example of a Holocaust survivor that is hearing and seeing things on TV that's bringing up fear and anxiety it it it's it hits close to home. This seems there's some similarities between uh, some of what this survivor is seeing uh, to perhaps some of the trauma that they experience. So Liba, yes, and in a little bit we're going to go over some things that uh, that you can say or how to approach a situation. Um, you know, and then and again another big trigger is um, not having access to basic needs. Are you know? one of the things that happens with trauma is this rupture in sense of safety, right? And all of a sudden, if you don't have, you know, the, the individual that didn't have enough money in, um, in their bank account when uh, this crisis started, right? And I think most of you probably remember going to the grocery stores and seeing images like this. And actually, many of you probably notice, even if you had those of you that had financial resources, your stressors were still up, right? Like, what is this? Oh my gosh, is does what does this mean for there not to be food? Are they going to get food? Um, do I have enough? 
Um, and stressor was faced for everybody there. But imagine if you didn't have, and or you don't have to imagine if you were one of those individuals that did not have money in your bank account at all. And the level of fear there of, I don't have enough right now. And if these shelves don't stock up, I'm not gonna be able uh, to get enough. And panic and fear uh, starts to set in because that is a threat. So let's, just as a reminder, as we start to go into then how do we respond, let's think of then how people, let's go back to this idea of chronic stress and how it affects us, right? Uh, so just to remind you, and I put these up here, and what's important is to understand that emotions impact behaviors. So sometimes, you know, if you're working with somebody, you're talking to somebody, and you're seeing what we call, what someone might judge as a difficult behavior, difficult interactions, um, I, I'm hoping that after this talk, maybe a little flag uh, comes up a little bit and, and that you start to ask yourself, I, I, I wonder maybe what's happened with this person or what they might be going through. Uh, so people behave very differently when they're, when they're under duress, right? And uh, early on when I asked you how many of you noticed that maybe you or, or your loved ones maybe a little bit snippier, maybe, you know, maybe there were meltdowns or maybe moods. So when we are under significant stress, we're likely to react in ways we would normally not. And um, that fight or flight has been activated um, and, um, and we may behave in ways we otherwise may not have. And an individual who has never been able to really relax um, or feel safe or, um, or feel like they can trust, they're always on. Um, you know, I've, we've done trainings. We, we have um, a food pantry, it's called The Cupboard. It's a kosher food pantry here in Broward County. And there are times uh, that those who come uh, to receive help uh, may not totally act in a, ple in a pleasant way. And, and you know, our volunteers, uh, we do trainings on trauma-informed training to help them see, you know, um, while you're here volunteering and trying to help, and they know they're coming here to get help, you're the person that might be stopping them from getting a large can of uh, a large bottle of peanut butter versus a small one. And from the purpose of wanting to make sure you have enough in your home, that raises anxiety. And perhaps, you know, the behavior might be to be critical or be upset or to argue. Um, but if you put that into context, um, and, and we understand that that behavior is really coming from fear, um, it, it'll allow us to approach a situation with compassion and, and with a different lens. So this is where trauma-informed, being trauma-informed and a trauma-informed care approach comes in. And, and honestly, the idea is when you're a trauma-informed organization or you're, you're working from this perspective is to basically assume that anyone that comes, uh, that is approaching you um, has experienced trauma um, and or might be under significant uh, stressors. And uh, there's four key elements to the trauma-informed approach. And one is that we realize that trauma is widespread. And I'm hoping that as, as you're seeing, as I'm just talking about some of the main, uh, not some of the main, some of the uh, individuals that we're aware of in Broward County have experienced trauma. If you, uh, there's many, many, many more than those that, um, that I pointed out to. It is widespread. Most of us will experience at least one major traumatic event um, by the time you know, we become seniors. Uh, so we want to also recognize the signs. You know, you learn some of the signs. We know our fight, uh, fight, flight response is on, what chronic stress looks like, how someone might respond when they're under duress. And then uh, the next piece is that we want to respond by integrating that into how we approach. So if you're working for an organization, uh, many organizations are taking on a trauma-informed approach. How do they write policies in a way to uh, inform others to create a space that's safe, that we have communications uh, with people that we're responding to them in a way that they can feel safe and feel like we're trustworthy um, because that will bring arousal down. And we actively seek to resist re-traumatizing. So we don't, if, if we understand what someone's triggers are, uh, we avoid uh, triggering them, for example. And there's six guiding principles that are up here, um, but I'm, I'm gonna move the next slide. We'll actually break them down but these are the six guiding principles of trauma-informed care. What we know is that trauma disrupts continuity, right? Yesterday, and, and I love this quote, um, that yesterday no longer foretells tomorrow. Um, I'll use, uh, again, the MSD example, you know, uh, a student that, um, that survived uh, the shooting on February 14th, uh, 
previously for for the the previous 10 to 12 to 13 years of their lives they got up every day they went to school they saw their friends they saw their teachers they did their work and they came home and they could rely pretty much on tomorrow's going to look the same way i'm going to get up i'm going to go to school i'm going to see my friends and i'm going to come home and somewhere in there I might be annoyed do some homework learn some stuff but that that's kind of the day to day and then the shooting happened and what we started to notice is that tomorrow we don't know what tomorrow might look like right and and that really shakes the foundations there's disruption and continuity in a, in a lot of ways um, so for someone who's experienced trauma there's disruptions in a sense of safety um, and in some of our examples here that we talked about today um, people in uniform may not be safe they may not uh, or they may not be trustworthy um, or maybe you can't count on them right so depending on, on where you're coming from uh, trustworthy there's disruptions in trust when there's trauma especially if, if organizations are, are involved so people or government institutions may hurt you or they don't have your best interests at heart uh, empowerment one of the very first things that goes in a traumatic event is a loss of control right something happened and I couldn't stop it and um, and that could lead to a sense of, of helplessness or hopelessness and if we look at um, within the COVID pandemic you know this idea of I can't do anything that changes or, or what can I do and, and actually on the flip side there are things right we'll talk about that on the other side how to respond here in a minute and then in terms of collaborations, there's disruptions in social connections, um, loss of friends and family, a place in society, uh, peer support as well. And, and here, you know, with in terms of social distancing may have led to some individuals actually socially isolating. And then there's historical, um, historical trauma uh, that could also uh, be playing a, a role in people's uh, responses. So what we say from this person-centered person-centered trauma-informed care is if we're seeing a behavior that, um, again, uh, you know, oftentimes we we may uh, describe someone based on how they're behaving. This is a difficult person or um, I guess that's, that's a, a, a common one that we hear quite often, right? But rather than going like, what's wrong with this person? Say, what happened to this person? Understanding that all behavior serves a purpose and is there for a reason. Uh, I, I like to tell, you know, my clinicians and even when we do trainings with our home health care aides that work with Holocaust survivors is if you're frustrated with someone, it just means you don't understand yet. Right. And um, and compassion comes from understanding. So how we respond in a trauma informed manner, um, understand that if somebody gets activated, um, it's really about safety. Uh, they don't feel safe. Uh, so if you're seeing, uh, if someone's maybe acting aggressively with you or arguing or screaming or, you know, they've escalated or they're shutting down, um, they're saying, never mind, they're, they're crying, they're walking away, they're storming out. Uh, what might be going on here is that their fight or flight response may have been activated and they're perceiving a threat. So one of the things to do is if you're able to remain calm, and a system and how uh, to manage their distress. Sometimes you can even ask, you know, what can I do right now? Um, the idea here is not to elevate yourself as well, because then it's going to be harder for someone uh, to come down. Trustworthiness, really important things, right? Uh, is to be on time and be consistent. Uh, those of you that are working in healthcare fields or you're volunteering or you're providing a service and or with your loved ones, it, this is one of the basic things. I like do do what you say you're going to do. Uh, people who have um, experienced trauma, especially if it was person-on-person -person trauma, um, why would they trust someone, right? And, and for some of that repair to happen, it really would mean that someone would need to be trustworthy. We tell our, our volunteers uh, who work with our Holocaust survivors, for example, uh, you know, if you say you're going to be there at 2 o'clock, come earlier versus don't, don't come later. You know, definitely be there by 2, but it's even better if you're there on time and that you're consistently there on time. Uh, change is hard uh, for someone who already feels like uh, the, the world is ambiguous and unclear. Empowerment is key. Uh, find ways for people to be involved in their own decisions, um, right? Um, if, so I spoke in the other slide how, you know, one of the things with COVID, for example, is what, what can I do? Or I can't do anything. And there is a lot, right? So the more information we arm ourselves with um, is what can I do? Well, we do know now, right? Social distancing does help. 
wearing masks, uh, reduce spread significantly. So these are things that people can do. Children, by the way, need, need some guidance in this area. Um, children look to us. So I would say uh, to parents and those of you that are around others that, that have children, it's also important to kind of check how we're responding uh, to these stressors uh, with, uh, with young ones, because they look to us. It's not only what we say, but it's how, how we're acting. Um, so we want to make sure that the message is, well, let's look at the information. Let's look at what we can do. Collaboration, um, working together, having supports, uh, all of these things are extremely important. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on here. These are some uh, common uh, triggers, though, that people uh, might be experiencing uh, during COVID, um, and also a, a variety of different challenges um, that we have right now, right? Like we, someone not having really uh, sufficient resources to, to purchase what they need, inability to visit family members, so not having access to support. Uh, unemployment, lack of child care options, all of these things. Uh, by the way, we have a lot of individuals avoiding medical care because they're, they're fearful of contracting the virus despite hospitals really having uh, quite a bit of measures in place. And um, this one of the things you can do is, uh, is try and encourage people if, if they are experiencing medical challenges to please reach out and get help. We, we have people unnecessarily experiencing more, um, more um, physical problems and, and medical problems because they're not addressing uh, their care due, due to fear. And, and I think if they're able to get information, uh, it'll, it'll help um, bring, uh, bring that activation down. So what do we do? All right, here's a big question. And the very first thing is to listen. And listen is, listening is very different from hearing. Um, listening is paying attention with intention to understand, to really get an idea of what is this like for this person, right? So, so I've been talking to you in generalities about how some individuals and how some groups might be impacted by COVID or what's on the news or um, social injustice, but not every person within those uh, groups is gonna respond to things or have, or, or have concerns about the same things. So we want to be careful that we're not overgeneralizing. Uh, person-centered, trauma-informed care means we're getting to understand that person and their experience. So uh, remember I said before that, uh, about compassion coming from understanding. So, so there are a few things we want to do. And I would say first is to slow down. Take time to actually listen to that person. Um, set the intention that you're going, oh, you know what I didn't include in here? Another important element to 2020 is we're, we're in, um, we're in an, an election year. And I would imagine, I probably don't have to see the show of hands, but how many of you have um, noticed frustrations uh, and or with yourself, with your own family, how do people talk about uh, their opinions and, and whatnot? And, and this works in that avenue as well. Uh, we've lost sometimes, uh, not sometimes, I, I believe in a lot of ways we, we've lost um, this uh, idea, the intention to listen, to understand. Uh, oftentimes we're, we're also, we're reacting. We may get triggered. We're reacting to respond, to defend, or to change someone's opinion. And the idea here, though, is to actually to stop and try and listen. Like, why does someone... Uh, feel the way they feel about something. Most of us do not feel heard. Um, we can ask for permission. Uh, this is uh, also uh, really important. You know, do you feel comfortable talking about this? So if you really wanted to, to ask or have a conversation, ask permission, is it okay if we talk about this? Uh, if you wanted to share your opinions, if somebody's uh, sharing and you've actively been listening to them and, and you'd like to, to share your side, uh, ask, would it be okay? Most people are not going to say no, but it's um, it actually allows for the conversation to, to flow, right? They're, they're having choice. Um, if you're visiting someone, those of you that, uh, you know, especially at this time, people are very concerned about, about safety. So asking, you know, may I come in? Where would you like me to sit? Uh, these types of things are very important. Asking open-ended questions also allows you to get more information from someone versus closed ending, you know, like, is this upsetting you? Um, we can ask more, you know, what's most difficult about uh, about this situation? So if we're talking about COVID and somebody says, oh, I'm really, I'm really scared, you know, what? what's the most difficult part for you? And it might surprise you that the things that you think might be uh, concerning someone may not be it whatsoever. Uh, so these, this is an important way of uh, not having blanket 
ideas of what could be uh, distressing somebody. We're really getting to know what it is for them. It is only with that that then we're able to help. Um, let's see here. And, and then there are certain things to avoid um, if we're trying uh, if we're trying to listen, if we're trying to connect, if we're truly trying to understand and to help someone feel safe in our presence, right? This is what this is about, how to set the space and the tone for someone to feel safe to share with us and to be within our presence in order to avoid uh, traumatizing or, or activating them. Um, avoid raising your voice, um, avoid using labels or criticizing, very important to avoid invalidating people's experiences. Uh, you know, oftentimes we do that with language without realizing. So somebody shares their point of view and we said, oh yeah, but, you know, we just, but, but have you thought of this? And, um, you know, we, uh, those, those types of situations uh, can, can be an issue. Avoid rushing. And then a big one here is avoid being silent. If there's something really important, don't, don't ignore that elephant in the room because um, that leaves people feeling like, um, we don't think what they're experiencing is important. Um, so I want to come back to Liba's question here, right? Um, so we, we have a couple here. So um, so the, you said that this felt like that the client, the survivor we work with said to me, she feels like this is another Holocaust. How would you respond to that? Uh, I've been speaking, and then we have um, here from uh, Lisa Henry, I've been speaking to a Holocaust survivor almost every day since March, and she has on occasions referred to this virus as another Holocaust, best response. Here, I would actually ask what she means, right? What does she mean by it? Uh, if I had, because if I had to guess, it could be that there's a lot of elements um, of what's happening that reminds her of her experience in the Holocaust, but again, we could all be be very wrong. So I would actually, I would take a moment to ask, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? Um, what does it mean to you? And I think you'll learn quite a bit. It could be, I, I feel trapped. I, I can't leave my house. And maybe that person wasn't hiding. Or it could be, I, I, I feel, you know, things are dangerous. Or, um, or maybe it's other things that they're watching on the news. So, um, asking what they mean will give you a better idea of, uh, of what it is, where the fear is coming from. Because uh, that's what they're telling you is, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm scared. Um, and if we can figure out what they're scared about, we might be able to, to think of ways to kind of help them ease their fear. What would they need in order to feel safer? Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question there. Um, important thing here, human beings, are resilient. So we've been talking about stress, we've been talking about trauma, but um, uh, you know, really, really important is uh, understanding that we bounce back from some incredible, and our Holocaust survivors are, are a testament to that. The fact that we have groups of people that have uh, gone through some of the most uh, atrocious experiences in history, and um, they've made connections, and they've had families, and uh, they've given back to their community. Uh, shows us that we are capable of so much more than what we realize. Uh, how we cope, so going back to stress a little bit, stress is the, meaning our current experiences exceed our coping mechanisms or our strategies. Uh, the good thing about that though is that we can learn. We can learn new coping skills or we could adopt uh, adapt those that we already have. If we think about today, coping and self-care today, um, what I challenge you guys is to get creative, and many of you probably have, and, and even help your clients or help those that you're working with or your loved ones get creative, because it, it may not be so much that the coping skills aren't there, is that uh, it's, challenge, it's a challenge to figure out how to make them work here, right? Um, being connected, the human connection is important, so helping people think about how they can still be connected. Uh, social distancing does not mean social isolation. I think that's an important message to get across. Um, consider new ways of doing old things, right? Or as people maybe were working out at the gym and now, you know, gyms may not be the place to go. What are other things that they can do? And there's a lot of, you know, technology has allowed us quite a bit of, um, of opportunities to do things. But I want to say, please remember, there's 
a population, uh, there's a lot of individuals in our population do not have access to Wi-Fi, they do not have access to computers, they do not have access to technology, and therefore we really need to, to think about how, how we can address uh, these challenges. Understand telehealth. It has never been easier to get mental health and, and, uh, and medical health services right now uh, because many are offering telehealth sessions. And um, limiting time watching, uh, watching the news or social media can be quite important, being healthy overall. And I want to say a note about breathing because we take this, uh, uh, sometimes we, we, no, we don't forget to breathe, we automatically breathe, but this is um, breathing with intention. And uh, there's a certain type of breath, we can call it diaphragmatic breathing or deep belly breathing, uh, rather than breathing from chest, is actually breathing so that your stomach, so your diaphragm uh, expands. And, um, and I wanted to say something, oftentimes people, especially if you notice somebody having, having a panic attack where they're trying to take a breath in and they can't, um, the trick to actually is have them breathe out and exhale. Uh, people uh, sometimes don't know that the most relaxing part of the breath is an exhale. If you don't believe me, try it now or as, as uh, once we head out, take, you know, fully exhale as far as you can. And one of the things you'll notice is your body will automatically take a deep breath in. Um, so being able to uh, think about intentionally breathing to relax. Uh, this is how to know when to reach out for help, really important. If you notice either in yourself, loved one, or, or clients or patients that their mood and their anxiety, their substance use or other behaviors are starting to get in the way of daily activities and it's happening for several ways, uh, several days in a row, that's the time to reach out for help. Um, I want a, a note on suicide uh, and suicide, uh, suicidal ideation. It's not uncommon for uh, thoughts to come up when people become very overwhelmed, but this is if, you know, ask your loved ones about thoughts. Um, you're not, you know, it's a myth that if you ask, somebody's going to be thinking about it. If they're thinking about it, they're thinking about it. Ask, and if this is here, this is not a time to wait. This is a time to reach out to someone uh, immediately. Um, quick, just about us. Uh, so we're the Counseling Centers of Goodman Jewish Family Services. And we have two locations in Davie and uh, one in Coral Springs and Parkland. We are right now fully offering telehealth services and we do individual groups. Uh, couples and psychoeducational testing. And I wanted to leave us on this note, and we will have a couple minutes for questions, but um, I mentioned before trauma disrupts connections, right? But connections is what helps us to heal from trauma. Uh, Judith Herman, which is, um, you know, a, a prominent expert in the, in the field of trauma, you know, had this quote um, in one of her books, Trauma and Recovery. And, and this is helplessness and isolation are the core experiences of trauma power and reconnections are the core experience of recovery. How we talk to people, the space that we create for others uh, to be, um, when it's with compassion and, uh, and allowing them to make decisions and empowering, this is how we heal from trauma. And it's up to all of us really to set, uh, set the space and set the world uh, that allows people to move forward. So with that, I want to thank you all, and, and I also want to open up, are there, are there any questions uh, that I can uh, address that I have not addressed? Let me see here from Debbie. Wanting to advise a young adult uh, to look at the bigger picture. In other words, this client is making the situation very personal, all about how it's affecting her. Uh, I don't want to scare her, but I'd like to ask her to find positives and, and grateful for her own health. So Debbie, you know, that, that's great. What I'm hearing there's two things. So one is this, this young adult actually sharing with you, which is fantastic because young adults don't tend uh, to maybe open up to adults. I'm guessing you're an adult. Um, and um, so, so that's fantastic. So she's, this, this young person is, is feeling safe enough to talk to you. Um, what I would say is still listen a little bit, bit more. Um, if we jump too quickly into what we call unsolicited advice, people tend to not listen to that. And actually it kind of shut, it's almost like they shut off. Uh, there are ways to lead into, it, into advice giving. You could say, oh, it sounds like you've been really going through a lot. You know, um, what have you been trying? Uh, I have some ideas that I've worked from other people. Are you okay if I share that with you? So asking for permission uh, to go into that realm will probably help you. Any, any other questions or thoughts? OK, 
Okay, oh wait. How to respond to older adults who are isolated because friends have died. Yeah, this is, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're seeing quite a bit of this. We have a lot of older adults uh, here in Broward County that really do not have loved ones uh, around. Um, you know, uh, part of this is to ask, you know, um, and this is a difficult question because many of them may not really have anyone to reach out to. You can ask if they're interested in, in learning about um, other ways to connect right now. Um, you know, there are, um, I believe the JCC uh, has some virtual events. Uh, I know that, you know, we have uh, some virtual, um, virtual uh, mental health kind of or wellness activities and a lot of places do as well. Uh, so it might be one of those uh, finding there are AARP actually has, I believe, a number you can call uh, and get calls. It's almost like a friendly visitor, but a friendly telephone call. Um, and uh, as, as ways to, or, or how they can connect uh, with their temple, how they connect, connect. There, there are individuals out there. And um, I think with, with our older adults uh, taking time to connect with them, uh, Toby, the fact that you are speaking with them uh, means you are a lifeline. Oh, thank, thank you, Liba, and, and thank you, everyone. I, I want to encourage you all, please feel free um, to reach out if you have any questions. Um, uh, and again, uh, Barbara uh, and, and the Federation, I want to thank you for, for hosting this and, and allowing me to speak. And everyone, thank you so much uh, for, for coming and, uh, uh, and learning about trauma-informed care.